and thank you for the invitation to come and speak with you this afternoon. Okay. There. <laughs> the political victory of Barack Obama on November 4th, 2008 demonstrated the success of the civil rights movement and its twin legacies of minority political empowerment and an ideology of toleration. A mere 40 years before, in 1968, reactionaries had silenced the voices of such apostles of racial change as the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy, both uh, promoted a vision of multiracial beloved community that celebrated diversity and dreamed of an America where all citizens received political freedom and social equality. Indeed, after assisting Brother John F. Kennedy's race for the White House, the new United States Attorney General Robert Kennedy had suggested in 1961 that the country seemed to be moving so fast in race relations that a black could be president in 30 or 40 years. In the intervening time, several African Americans had placed their names in nomination. Shirley Chisholm, Jesse Jackson, Alan Keyes, Yet it took the campaign of a post-Jim Crow candidate raised in the aftermath of the Civil Rights Movement to successfully transcend the issue of race and attract a majority vote from the nation's electorate. The country's first president of mixed race ancestry, Barack Obama, who was raised in Hawaii and Indonesia with family ties to a variety of religious and spiritual beliefs, won the election with 52% of the vote. The victory marked a seismic shift taking place in an American population destined to become majority multiracial, black, Hispanic, East Asian, South Asian, by mid-century. His campaign benefited from political empowerment movements of minorities derived from old civil rights struggles and also from a new ideology of tolerance symbolized in memorials to the civil rights movement and taught through the public schools. The watershed election of Barack Obama in 2008 resulted from the life work of such living legacies of the civil rights struggle as United States Congressman John Lewis of Atlanta. The victory of American forces in World War II ushered in an age of global hegemony that made the nation's ideology of democracy and free markets appear contradictory to local custom throughout the South and elsewhere in the country where authorities denied citizenship rights to African Americans and other ethnic minorities. I'll just quickly, this photograph is of course President Obama, uh, but also Congressman John Lewis, and we'll come back to uh, Lewis in a second. But segregation was the custom in the South that separated the races black and white by law. Uh, changes in the post-war era, however, made this system impractical. Similarly, a change in the region's political economy, away from an old colonial system of extracted wealth collected in agricultural products and raw materials, and towards a modern manufacturing sector of wage earners in a consumer-driven economy, required changes in the marketplace and workforce that made segregation seem irrational and inefficient. And this is a classic photograph showing the public display of segregation, a nice water fountain for white people and a little terrible water fountain over here for black people. Uh, and the segregation would play out throughout society uh, in public restrooms and public accommodations uh, and other forms of interaction in the public sphere. Uh, but from the top down, the United States Supreme Court ruled against the legal structure of segregation that Plessy versus Ferguson uh, had allowed, culminating in the Brown versus Board of Education decision of 1954 that reversed the previous policy. Meanwhile, from the ground up, African Americans demanded the equality required of the separate but equal clause as demonstrated in the Montgomery bus boycott of 1955 and 56. Yet such nonviolent passive resistance seemed too slow to a new generation of black wage earners who embraced direct action confrontation. The growing expectations among young black consumers uh, contributed to the spontaneous outburst of the sit-in movement in Greensboro, North Carolina in February 1960. 
the unwillingness to work within a segregated system while insisting on receiving citizenship rights guaranteed by the U.S. Constitution marked a clear transition in the civil rights struggle. This photograph shows the four black men who in February of 1960 sat down at a lunch counter in Woolworths of uh, Greensboro, North Carolina and demanded equal service in clear violation of the segregation law. And this sit-in uh, protest here in Greensboro begun by these men quickly spread uh, throughout the South. Indeed, in Nashville, Tennessee, students already had participated in a sit-in campaign that did not attract uh, the media attention uh, as this one in Greensboro. Led by an African-American theologian named James Lawson, who attended Vanderbilt University, the students, who included John Lewis, the young man from, George, uh, from Alabama, uh, discussed uh, in this... Uh, um, in these sessions with uh, James Lawson, the theologian, uh, they discussed the independence movement uh, in India led by Mahatma Gandhi, uh, the strategies of nonviolence and soul force, and thought of ways to apply those against segregation in the American South. The experience changed the life of John Lewis. Uh, born a, and this is uh, John Lewis right here, kneeling in a, a, a protest in a sit-in in Nashville, uh, born on a sharecropper's farm in rural Alabama in 1940, the African-American John Lewis confronted a racist society that ostensibly provided him with few opportunities in life. While growing up, his family protected him from the harshest aspects of the segregated society. But as a youth, he related to the lynching of Emmett Till, who was just a year his junior. This is a very famous case of the violent death of a young 13-year-old boy from Chicago who was visiting his family in Mississippi. And it resonated among uh, black youth throughout the South who were the same age as Till, uh, including uh, John Lewis. When the Montgomery bus boycott broke, boycott broke out in 1955, John Lewis marveled over the black community's ability to come together. He embraced the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. as a role model. And with the help of King, Lewis attended the American Baptist Theological Seminary in Nashville. An atypical youth to begin with, John Lewis embarked on an education that took him out of the classroom and onto the civil rights battlefield in a campaign that would lead him to the halls of the United States Congress. The idealism that accompanied the election of John F. Kennedy as the first Irish Roman Catholic president extended to many of his generation and their children, the baby boomers, who saw unlimited potential in a hegemonic United States that dominated the globe. The ideology promulgated internationally made omissions of equal rights at home particularly glaring. As Manning Marable argues in his book, Race, Reform, and Rebellion, the Second Reconstruction actually began in earnest on that afternoon of February 1st, 1960. On that day, direct action nonviolence by the four black men who sat down at the Woolworths in Greensboro, North Carolina, at that lunch counter demanding equal service as consumers in America, provoked a series of protests across the South against discrimination, collectively known as the Civil Rights Movement. The spontaneous sit-ins by black and some white youth led to the organization of a multiracial group called the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or SNCC. As a veteran of the Nashville struggle, John Lewis, along with Diane Nash and others, joined with the black youth of Greensboro and elsewhere across the South, including Atlanta, in organizing SNCC in the spring of 1960. SNCC was made up of black youth who were embracing the idealism expressed by the young President Kennedy. Out of the sit-ins uh, came the Freedom Rides of 1961 that put pressure on local, state, and federal governments that allowed the racial discrimination to continue. John Lewis joined a handful of black and white civil rights activists in the original Freedom Ride, 
that left Washington, D.C. in May of 1961, testing Southern compliance with federal desegregation requirements in interstate travel. At Rock Hill, South Carolina, some white vigilantes harassed the group, after which John Lewis left to attend a scholarship meeting in Nashville to support his education, but with the intent of rejoining the protest before it ended in New Orleans. The Freedom Ride then traveled on from Rock Hill, South Carolina, throughout Georgia without incident, but ran into conflict in Alabama, where Ku Klux Klansmen attacked the Freedom Riders in Anniston and again in Birmingham. Once he completed his school interviews, John Lewis rejoined the Freedom Ride in Birmingham, Alabama. When the bus reached Montgomery, Ku Klux Klansmen savagely beat him along with the white activist Jim Zwerg. And this is a photograph of John Lewis and Jim Zwerg right after they were brutally beaten by Ku Klux Klansmen in Montgomery, Alabama during the Freedom Ride. These spontaneous uh, acts by black youth, the sit-ins, the Freedom Rides, sponsored by such multiracial groups as SNCC, presented a decentralized approach to reform from below, as explained by the historian Claiborne Carson in his seminal study, In Struggle. King and the black ministers involved in the Southern Christian Leadership Conference followed a more bureaucratic and authoritarian approach to change from above, as detailed in Bearing the Cross and other scholarship by David Garrow. These two approaches, the students from below and King and his organization from above, often clashed. For as the theorist Gene Sharp has discovered in his years studying nonviolence, there are many approaches to nonviolent resistance to oppression and discrimination. Nonetheless, the era's idealistic view of America that President Kennedy helped promote it, and the media's growing attention to the persistence of Southern racial discrimination within a global framework of competition uh, between powers where racism was uh, unsupportable and where the medium uh, was the message of the broadcast by the newspapers forced a self-reflection in America. By the Birmingham demonstrations in the spring of 1963, the nation could no longer, uh, to, oh, there's Congressman Lewis leading the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Oh, and Dr. King, sorry, of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Of course, these two uh, were friends, and Lewis had long admired uh, Dr. King. And yet the organizations they headed uh, did not always agree. Uh, the students were radical. Uh, they were more aggressive. They were less willing to compromise and negotiate uh, with white authority figures. Dr. King, who had worked within the system, uh, was very willing to negotiate. By the spring of 1963 in Birmingham, Alabama, the civil rights movement reached a climax. King and the SCLC joined the local movement led by the Reverend Fred L. Shuttlesworth in protests against racial discrimination in public accommodations, voting, and employment in the industrial city of the New South, Birmingham. The sit-ins at lunch counters by African Americans demanding basic services as consumers in April 1963 had expanded by May to include protest marches led by school children. Rather than grant these demand, uh, demanded rights and citizenship, authorities in Birmingham turned loose police dogs on nonviolent protesters and turned on fire hoses against black teenagers marching for civil rights. These images appeared in newspapers around the globe and shocked the world about the inequality that existed in a United States that was promoting democracy uh, in uh, world politics. Outrage followed nationally and internationally as calls for reform reached the United States Congress. Indeed, Birmingham provided the climax of the civil rights movement. And these protests in Birmingham galvanized the nation and forced President John F. Kennedy to intervene on behalf of race reform. <laughs> 
And so we see the federal government uh, changing its policy uh, and ultimately taking a more active role uh, promoting race reform in America. The March on Washington for jobs and freedom simply celebrated that fact. Instead of the massive protests in the Capitol as envisioned by A. Philip Randolph, the event became an affirmation of the American dream. No one sounded that theme better than the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who gave the address of his life before an integrated audience here at Washington of at least a quarter of a million people, with millions more people watching by television. With rolling cadences, his I Have a Dream speech epitomized American uh, desire, African American desires for assimilation into the American system. Nearly tailor-made to fit the demands of the civil rights legislation before the Congress that President Kennedy had proposed after Birmingham, the oration reasoned the need for race reform, just like Dr. King's letter from Birmingham jail, while concluding with the resounding expression of faith in the American system. The youngest speaker at the March on Washington that day, and the only one still alive today, was John Lewis, who represented SNCC. In his speech, Lewis intended to rhetorically ask, which side is the federal government on? Pressing the issue that the government had not been supporting civil rights activities in the South, but instead had really assisted reactionaries to race reform, trying to maintain segregation. Which side is the federal government on, he wanted to say. But Dr. King and the other moderate leaders of the movement convinced John Lewis to cut out the radical language. Instead, he ended his speech with the challenge of the youth in SNCC. We want our freedom, and we want it now. These gentlemen here, and this is A. Philip Randolph who planned the March on Washington. Here is Dr. King, and you can see here is John Lewis, the youngest man at this table, and he bowed to the pressure of his elders uh, and altered his language. Years of avoiding race reform came to an end as the Kennedy administration promoted legislation to open the system to black people and other minorities. Following the assassination of President Kennedy in November of 1963, the Texan President John, uh, Lyndon B. Johnson pushed through the Congress as a tribute to the martyred Kennedy uh, and over the filibuster of Southern Democrats, uh, senators, that is, legislation that marked a watershed in American race reform. Had uh, Senator, uh, previously uh, Senator Johnson, not learned how politics work in Washington, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 would never have been passed. Uh, but he knew how to pull the strings in the Congress to get the legislation through. And he successfully overcame a filibuster by Southern senators designed to kill uh, the legislative reforms. Uh, Johnson encouraged passive of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 that ended discrimination in public accommodations and outlined equal employment opportunities, thereby opening the American system not only to African Americans but also to other minorities. The next two years expanded the race reforms through calls for voting rights in southwest Georgia, Mississippi, and finally in the reveting protests in Alabama's Black Belt. King and the SCLC joined John Lewis and the black youth in SNCC in Selma, Alabama in a call for voting rights. The demonstrations evolved into a protest march to uh, Montgomery to demand from the Alabama governor, George C. Wallace, to allow for voting practices, uh, fair voting practices. John Lewis stood at the head of the 600 marchers who crossed the Edmund Pettus Bridge on that day, uh, this is a line of marchers. Dr. King was not there. Next to Lewis is a leader named Hosea Williams, uh, who for many years will be in politics in Georgia. At the head of this march on that Sunday that's known today as Bloody Sunday, March uh, of 1965, when the demonstrators reached the foot of the bridge,
Alabama State Patrolmen attacked. They moved in with tear gas, brutally beating John Lewis and leaving him with a fractured skull. This photograph shows John Lewis having been beaten to the ground. He's about to be hit again by this officer with a club. It will fracture his skull. The effort of white southern authorities to suppress the black demand for the franchise led to federal support for voting rights. Again, it was President Lyndon B. Johnson who intervened, appearing on television to quote the anthem of the civil rights movement, We Shall Overcome, an anthem that, of course, today is an international anthem for all people seeking freedom and democracy. And to propose legislation, Johnson uh, proposed legislation to secure the franchise for minorities. Once passed and then enforced uh, through the Congress and the federal government, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 led to black political empowerment across America as African Americans and rural areas of the Deep South and the urban centers of the Industrial North took charge of local governments. These changes signified integration into the existing political system and a shift in the distribution of resources into communities previously neglected. The result of the growing black electorate and changes in the racial attitudes of many Americans ultimately contributed to the election of Barack Obama as the nation's first African American president. Oh, this is again the riot. There's Congressman Lewis. Uh, and this was the march that followed afterwards when King came back to Selma. Uh, here's King, uh, and they marched again. Uh, this is Ralph Abernathy, and here is Congressman John Lewis next to this nun. Uh, and they actually carried through on the march from Selma to Montgomery. Uh, and it was during that time uh, in the United States Congress uh, that the Voting Rights Act was being uh, set forward and would be proposed. Uh, this was the end of the march uh, there. And this was the arrival in Montgomery. Uh, after the success of uh, Selma, King tried to take the movement into the North in 1966. But as an external force that did not resonate with a local movement, uh, the Chicago campaign fell flat. In the suburbs of Chicago, King said he found racism worse than any he experienced in the South. While advocating fair housing in Cicero, Illinois, white counter-protesters pelted him with bricks. After spending several weeks living in the ghetto, he abandoned Chicago, but with the knowledge that the problems being faced by African Americans extended beyond mere racism, having gained access to the system, being able to cast ballots or sit at the lunch counter uh, and order that hamburger, uh, that proved of limited value if one could not afford to pay for the food. King came to understand the role of poverty in perpetuating racism. Soon, he linked this understanding to the broader issue of anti-colonialism. By 1967, King announced his opposition to the war in Vietnam during a speech in New York at the Riverside Church. Thereafter, President Lyndon B. Johnson turned his back on King and the civil rights movement, as did civil rights leaders who rejected King for his radicalism. By 1968, Martin Luther King had concluded that the problems of America were not those of race, but those of class. Poverty was at the root of the system's oppression that left so many people excluded from the American dream. He proposed a poor people's campaign to organize dispossessed Americans into a nationwide movement. Thousands of poor people, black, white, Native American, Asian, Hispanic, uh, were to descend on the nation's capital. And unlike during the March on Washington in 1963, this time they would occupy the congressional buildings demanding housing, health care, jobs, education, a better life. While assisting a strike of garbage men in Memphis, Tennessee, King was assassinated on April 4, 1968, by James Earl Ray. Only months before, King had despaired, we live in a sick and neurotic nation. 
out of the social darkness of America's present ills, morning will surely come. If I didn't believe this, I couldn't make it. He was 39 years old. Riots followed in 50 cities. Just before his death, King had authored a book that asked the question, where do we go from here, chaos or community? In many ways, the question is still being answered. But the election of Barack Obama suggests the country has decided that community is its response. Whereas King had responded to the crisis of the 1960s by broadening his view about the problems in America by proposing an interracial poor people's campaign, the black radicals in SNCC turned separatist by viewing the ills of society. Oh, King's funeral. Um, sorry. SNCC. Um, the black radicals in SNCC turned separatist by viewing the ills of society through the distorted lens of race. As advocates of black power, they saw the primacy of race as all-consuming. Previously, John Lewis, who had participated in the sit-ins, Freedom Rides, Selma Campaign, and advocated Dr. King's vision of a multiracial beloved community, Lewis had headed uh, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee as its chairman. But separatists forced him out and put in office Stokely Carmichael, who coined the phrase black power during the Meredith March of 1966. At first, it was a return to a black nationalism that emphasized economic self-help and African-American institutions, responding to decades of white supremacy designed to make people feel inferior African-American intellectuals promoted black is beautiful. Determined to make it on their own, the black members in SNCC kicked the white members out of the organization. They rejected the white-dominated system and everything it stood for in America. Carmichael and other black SNCC members were influenced in their thinking by the writings of Malcolm X. They admired the independence of the lost found nation of Islam or black Muslims and the message of black separatism, economic self-help and self-defense against white racists. Inspired by the political activism uh, of rural African Americans in Lowndes County, Alabama, who had used the symbol of a black panther to represent their separatist political party, Bobby Seals and Huey P. Newton organized the Black Panther Party in Oakland, California in 1966 around the principles of self-defense against racial oppression. They developed a 10-point program based on ideas expressed by the Algerian independence leader and intellectual Franz Fanon. They saw the inner city black poor as an oppressed uh, black colony within white America. Feeling trapped in the ghetto with no chance of escape, the Black Panthers tried to combat the devastating pot uh, poverty of the urban core. Their rhetoric suggested the government had coordinated a plan of genocide against African Americans. They realized that many black people had been shut out of the system with limited access to education and training necessary for work in a post-industrial world many black people had missed the boat on the better paying jobs of the modern economy. As images of the desperate black poor caught up in New Orleans 35 years later when the levees broke after Hurricane Katrina makes clear the diagnosis of a trapped black underclass in the inner city shut out of the system as articulated by the Black Panthers was not entirely incorrect. Other African Americans expressed access to the system and prospered as the 60s gave way to the 70s. Many middle class black Americans achieved integration with better paying jobs, admission to the better formerly all white schools, improvements in housing, steady increases in general standards of living. 
black political empowerment came to symbolize their success. After the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, federal registrars oversaw southern elections and guaranteed political equality. With the growing black electorate rising from 43% in 1964 to 62% in 1968, many black candidates for political office now receiving a fair shake in the campaign and in many cases appealing to a majority black electorate won positions of power that enabled them to shift resources back to the black community. Furthermore, interpenetration by the federal courts of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 with affirmative action decisions increased African American contractors gaining lucrative government contracts. Consequently, the black middle class grew as its influence expanded. In Atlanta, a plaster worker named Herman Russell became a general contractor and through these contracts, a multimillionaire. The Pascal family that owned a popular African-American restaurant landed contracts to provide food for the bustling international airport and became multimillionaires. John Lewis's personal story reflected the potential of this racial change. Forced out of SNCC in 1966 because of the black separatism, he continued working for civil rights within the system, struggling uh, to lead the uh, voter education project, which was financed by the Ford Foundation. This effort promoted voter registration of African Americans across the South in compliance with the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Living in Atlanta, Lewis also headed the National Consumer Co-op Bank. Through these two initiatives, he promoted black political and economic access to the system. In 1977, he made an unsuccessful run for the United States Congress, after which President Jimmy Carter appointed him to manage the VISTA program and other federal projects. In 1981, John Lewis won election to the Atlanta City Council. Then, in a hotly contested race against his old friend and fellow civil rights activist, Julian Bond, who today heads the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, John Lewis won the election to the United States House of Representatives in Atlanta's majority black 5th Congressional District in 1986. He has since been re-elected 10 times, winning up to 70 percent of the vote. As a congressman, Lewis has worked to memorialize the civil rights movement as a way of promoting voting rights and proselytizing the beloved community. This image shows that idea. This is within the Atlanta Civil Rights Memorial run by the National Park Service. It takes an image from the civil rights movement of a civil rights march, a protest march, with these life cast mannequins uh, marching to freedom, uh, and we see a variety of people of different races, African American and white woman here, handicapped here, uh, and gendered, uh, so a variety of uh, peoples represented in the struggle uh, for equality. Uh, as uh, the, uh, his tenure in office coincided with his groundswell of support by cities and states for monuments to the civil rights movement, best characterized by the exhibitry one finds on display, that of these life cast monochromatic mannequins marching to freedom. Sometimes they're riding on a bus or sitting in at a lunch counter, uh, these dioramas of the civil rights struggle. As ubiquitous to these institutions as a Civil War soldier on the courthouse square had been to defend white supremacy, these civil rights figures mark a commemoration that symbolizes America's new ideology of toleration that celebrates diversity. Whether in Atlanta, such as here, or Birmingham, Selma, Memphis, Montgomery, an evolving collective memory of triumphant toleration rises above a localized narrative often framed within the life and work of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Born out of this post-war world of uh, racial strife that identified these cities as part of a larger civil rights struggle, 40 years later, the once contested memories uh, have helped ease racial tension 
through these museums. Now encapsulated in these institutes and it displays, civil rights memories are embraced by urban leaders. Expressed through architecture, art, and museum artifact, the once uh, distinct memories have become increasingly the same, all announcing an inevitable victory over oppression. And the pilgrims who visit these celebrated sites are greeted by local, state, and federal employees of the heritage tourism industry who have standardized a racially progressive message that has knocked off center the once popular urban observances of white supremacy symbolized by wreath-laying ceremonies at Civil War monuments. Every year, Congressman uh, John Lewis brings a group of men and women from the United States House of Representatives across the South to see the sites of the civil rights struggle. Here he is discussing outside the site of the Montgomery bus boycott and the Rosa Parks Museum in Montgomery. Freshman uh, Senator, uh, oh, this is, a, this is a site in Atlanta, uh, the whole uh, civil rights memorial site that has been constructed there. Uh, the Selma March. Uh, that took place to memorialize uh, the civil rights struggle here. Uh, freshman Senator Barack Obama attended one of these pilgrimages uh, with Congressman Lewis. Now the effort to memorialize the movement, while spontaneous and independent, uh, has uh, resulted in similar outcomes. City and state governments and state and local planners assisted movement veterans and scholars in developing these memorials. In some instances, national museum consultants and the federal government participated in the planning. Here we see the federal government's involvement in Selma. Uh, the goal of heritage tourism has become the driving force as chambers of commerce advertise the racist past for tourist dollars. Indeed, black political empowerment has made possible significant public monies for these various enterprises. The commercial appeal of these memorials uh, mark a significant departure from earlier expressions of a Southern collective memory of white supremacy uh, that some scholars like Fitz Bundage has looked at. The relationship between Civil War monuments and white supremacy that Kirk Savage has explored in his study, Standing Soldiers Kneeling Slaves. Uh, but this is reversed now with civil rights memorials showing racial equality uh, in society. Uh, so these transformations uh, that are taking place through civil rights memorialization uh, are all underscoring a new triumphant uh, toleration as an ideology in America. Two months after King's death in uh, 1968, the heirs joined the city of Atlanta in proposing a living permanent memorial in historic district uh, consisting of the King birth home, uh, which was uh, located up here, Ebenezer Baptist Church, which is located here where King preached. Uh, a Martin Luther King Jr. Center, which is located here to house uh, some of Dr. King's uh, papers, and then a grave site uh, for the permanent entombment of Dr. King. And after his wife, Coretta Scott King, died, she too uh, has been buried uh, there. Uh, Coretta Scott King created this Martin Luther King Jr. Center for Nonviolent Social Change to memorialize the man. She con uh, contacted the Johnson and Nixon administration and asked for assistance from the federal government uh, to construct this memorial in 1975. Uh, but the city of Atlanta uh, is the one who came forward to help finance uh, the site. Uh, and consequently, uh, she had to rely on some municipal support and private monies uh, raising uh, charitable contributions of over six million dollars to help finance the construction of this memorial. Uh, and in the end, she raised almost the entirety of the complex, uh, which opened uh, fully complete in 1982. When Congress in 1980 created the Martin Luther King Jr. National Historic Site and Preservation District, which is this whole area lined out in green, uh, it signified federal intervention in what was called the King Shrine area. Uh, this has evolved into almost complete control of the King Memorial by the federal government. So taking what had been a private effort and now federalizing it. The legislation authorized the National Park Service to develop historic preservation plans, address resource management, to purchase private property, to preserve the look of the appearance by this point, the King Center was running deficits and having trouble maintaining uh, its uh, viability. In September of 1990, the announcement Atlanta would host the Olympics in 1996, 
provided the government with an excuse to propose $11 million worth of investment uh, to create a huge visitor center uh, in this area. It will be built right here. And I showed you that photograph of the mannequins marching to freedom, uh, which is the centerpiece of that uh, center. Uh, again, the uh, idea was to provide a facility that could accommodate the estimated 5 million tourists who visit King's Tomb uh, annually. And the Park Service received support from not only the Atlanta City Council and the Mayor Maynard Jackson of Atlanta, but also the United States Representative John Lewis uh, and other elected black officials in the Congress who were able to push through the Congress the $11 million funding prize. Uh, as a result, uh, the entire Auburn Avenue area was rebuilt. Similarly, John Lewis spearheaded the federal effort to turn the Selma to Montgomery March route, uh, the highway through rural Alabama, into a national historic trail. Uh, and this is the symbol of that trail. Selma's municipal leaders memorialized the movement uh, for reasons of heritage tourism, although the grassroots activists who had been involved in civil rights reform saw an opportunity to try to alter the local political situation. The limited success of black political empowerment was a bone of contention for many in the African American community. The white mayor of Selma, a man named uh, John, uh, Joe Smitherman, who had been mayor when King marched there with John Lewis in 1965, was still mayor uh, in the year 2000. They wanted to see him ousted, uh, and consequently they promoted memorialization for political reform. Uh, John Lewis uh, and others uh, participated in a reenactment of the famous march uh, in 1972, uh, and this uh, began a series of observances uh, that culminated in the 25th anniversary of the Selma to Montgomery march uh, in 1990. Uh, this shows uh, the realization that you could use the national civil rights struggle uh, as memorialization to promote voting reform. Uh, hands that picked cotton can pick presidents. That was the slogan of SNCC, and it was appropriate in the year 2000. Uh, and so we find uh, this struggle taking place in Selma. Selma capitalized on civil rights tourism uh, while also promoting its antebellum history of Greek revival mansions uh, of the Civil War. From Civil War to Civil Rights, uh, the promotional literature uh, said, as it juxtaposed images of Sturdivant Hall with Brown Chapel, uh, the church out of which the Civil Rights Movement had emerged. Smitherman, the white mayor, dedicated a marker at the park at the foot of the Edmund Pettus Bridge before black dignitaries Coretta Scott King, Jesse Jackson, Ben Chavis, and Dick Gregory uh, retraced the steps of the original marchers across the Alabama River. And then a racially mixed crowd of some 4,000 people participated in the 1990 event that galvanized efforts to memorialize the movement. After that reenactment, Congressman John Lewis returned to Washington and convinced Congress to adopt the Selma to Montgomery National Trail Study that authorized the National Park Service to explore declaring the 54 miles between the two cities a National Historic Trail. After receiving a positive report from park rangers, Congress approved the designation in 1995, earmarking millions of dollars in federal aid for the project. Now this will result uh, in this civil rights memorialization in Selma, uh, and the effort will continue. Indeed, the message coming out of Selma, celebrating uh, pluralism and toleration, will be carried to the nation by Congressman John Lewis, who joined with the white mayor, Joe Smitherman, on Oprah and other TV talk shows to boost Selma and voting rights. During the Summer Olympics, John Lewis and Joe Smitherman jointly carried the torch across the Edmund Pettus Bridge. And then by 1996, the city generated $5 million through heritage tourism. But when President Bill Clinton, pictured here, arrived for the bridge crossing jubilee reenactment in the year 2000, uh, and this is a picture of that, and they're uh, getting ready to cross the bridge. They're walking through downtown Selma. Uh, this is the annual event that takes place every March in Selma in remembrance of the voting rights struggle in the city dating back to the Bloody Sunday protest of 1965 when President Clinton joined thousands of people. He uh, was uh, supported by Mayor Smitherman, 
uh, who was also here uh, in the crowd that day. Smitherman said, It is a great honor to have the President of the United States visit our historic city. This will open doors for enormous tourism in our city. For Congressman John Lewis, who's pictured over here, uh, the arrival of the president symbolized African-American access to the system through the ballot box and the promise of the beloved community. While tourism promotes an excellent vehicle for the transmission of a new ideology of toleration, civil rights memorials have struggled uh, with a bifurcated goal of commemorating the past but also advocating present change. Coretta Scott King created the uh, commemoration of the King Center in Atlanta to memorialize the man through the built environment, but also to memorialize an ongoing struggle through the celebration of a national holiday established in King's honor in 1986. Problems persist, but the commemoration itself reflects the success of change. Rather than a national stage, the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute has latched on to the atomized individual in a world of bigotry as the target of its ideology of toleration. Building on the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, the Institute encourages visitors to take a Birmingham Pledge, which uh, amounts to a promise of toleration uh, to make the world a better place. Likewise in Selma, a similar thing, embracing the notion of civil rights and voting rights uh, as the way to create toleration in our society. Congressman John Lewis has represented the living embodiment of that political sacrifice. He hoped to see the fulfillment of Dr. King's vision of a beloved community. Lewis became a strong supporter of the Clinton administration, serving as a senior chief deputy whip in the Democratic caucus and regularly meeting with the president's cabinet. With the election of Republican George W. Bush uh, under questionable circumstances in 2000, it was Congressman John Lewis who emerged one of the harshest critics of the new administration. Congressman Lewis became the first member of the U.S. House of Representatives to suggest impeaching George W. Bush for deliberately, systematically violating the law. Lewis said of Bush, he is not king, he is president. And when Hillary Clinton announced her bid for president, John Lewis endorsed her candidacy. Once the winter, two uh, once the winter 2008 primaries began, however, John Lewis responded to the surprise success of Barack Obama and quickly moved his support to the black senator from Illinois. As Lewis noted on February 12, 2008, something is happening in America and people are prepared and ready to make that great leap. For Congressman Lewis, the Obama candidacy symbolized the success of his years of advocating voting rights and black political empowerment. Indeed, Obama represented the possibilities of access to the system, one through equal treatment of the law and affirmative action. As a post-Jim Crow candidate, he had attended uh, public and private schools, worked with social agencies and corporate law firms, held both state and federal political offices. When Obama won the Democratic primary, John Lewis said, If someone had told me this would be happening now, I would have told them they were crazy, out of their minds. They don't know what they're talking about. Then, recognizing the civil rights legacies that had led up to the Obama nomination, Congressman Lewis said, I just wish the others were around to see this day, to the people who were beaten, put in jail, were asked questions they could never answer simply to register to vote. It's amazing. This photograph shows just one of many protests uh, or civil rights meeting kind of events where Congressman Lewis has met up with, at this point he was Senator uh, Barack Obama. Throughout the fall 2008 presidential campaign, Senator Barack Obama stuck to a message of positive change that avoided racial implications and promised reforms to Bush administration abuses. His opponent, the reactionary Republican John McCain, ran a negative race designed to appeal to white voters and to discredit Obama as an old school liberal.
Among conservative voters in the Deep South and the West, McCain received support. But in the nation's urban centers on the West Coast and the Northeast and even in the Deep South, like in Atlanta, Obama carried the day. In the end, President Obama won 28 states and 52% of the popular vote, while McCain won 22 states and 46% of the popular vote. People across America greeted the election day with vigils at civil rights sites and those temples of toleration built as memorials to the civil rights movement. With the announcement of Obama's victory, the crowded audience at Atlanta's Ebenezer Baptist Church in the King Shrine area and near the grave sites of Coretta Scott King and Martin Luther King, advocates of change, those in attendance burst into tears as spontaneous celebrations broke out across America and joy over the election of Obama. Congressman John Lewis casts a large shadow uh, across President Barack Obama's inauguration. On the eve of the event, in an effort to recall that earlier moment in 1963, President Obama held an event at the Lincoln Memorial where 45 years before, a young John Lewis had stood and spoken to the thousands watching the March on Washington. Now, Obama addressed millions of viewers as he called up the memories of the earlier struggle. Two days later, at the inauguration, Congressman John Lewis sat with the former presidents, this is Congressman Lewis here, sat with the former presidents, the presidential family, and the honored guests beside the president-elect. During his address, President Obama acknowledged the sacrifices of civil rights activists and then singled out John Lewis for praise. At the conclusion, he turned to Congressman Lewis, and before speaking to anyone else, he leaned over to Congressman Lewis to shake his hand and said, because of you, John, indeed, the sacrifices of this poor black boy from rural Alabama, John Lewis, who stood up for civil and human rights for all people as symbolized by the vote, has enabled America to enter a new age capable of electing a mixed-race descendant of recent immigrants with that unusual name, Barack Obama, as President of the United States. Thank you.